Okay. Recording? Recording. Um, this is uh, Better Agile Drupal Sprints. My name is Chris Urban. Um, uh, the goal for this session, um, if you're a developer or a project manager or you do kind of everything, uh, is to give you some quick uh, synopsis of uh, ways you can use Dr uh, JIRA as a project management tool to help you with your development teams or your development work if you're working solo. Um, and we're going to get into some advanced topics near the end of the session where you can leverage JIRA's uh, REST API to build some custom reporting. Um, so I try to make this session um, a little bit of everything, but I will go through a lot pretty quickly. If there's anything you don't understand, please don't hesitate to stop and ask questions because we never have enough time at the end. Um, and I have this distilled down, so I factor in for questions. Um, so first question, raise, uh, raise your hand. Have you used JIRA before? Do you know what JIRA is? Does anybody not know what JIRA is? It's okay to say, yes, I have no idea what JIRA is. <laughs> okay, so everybody does know. Um, all right, so that's that's the important thing. So first thing... I think there are a couple of you. Yeah, can you explain it anyway? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so and JIRA... Are slides available anywhere? Uh, slides for Jared? No. That's, it's for this presentation. Oh, uh, no, I, I'll have this deck posted um, after the session. I'll have it posted on the site. Um, there will be two, two GitHub repositories that I'll point you to. That will give you everything that you'll need. Um, so for those that do not know, Jira is uh, one of the products made by Atlassian Software um, for project management. Um, they're best known for Jira and Confluent, uh, Confluence. And uh, they also recently acquired Trello, which is kind of a Jira light, for lack of a better explanation. The concept is that every issue, like a Zendesk or any kind of bug tracking tool, uh, it's a repository where issues are recorded, updated, and maintained or progressed through a workflow that you can customize, the simplest being to do, doing, done. And those tickets or issues in Jira can be viewed and updated to reflect the progress of that work. Is it something that you're developing? Is it a bug that you're fixing? Is it a feature request that you're evaluating? All of that can be used through a tool like Jira. Um, if you've never used it, there is a community license. You can download it and install it and run it on your local machine. I would say don't even bother. Um, you're probably better off signing up to use a cloud subscription. Um, if you've never used Trello, I recommend you do try that. That is free, and that's very much a what you see is what you get, a way to put cards on a screen and organize them, prioritizing them, moving them among columns. We'll get into a little bit more details about that, but that's, the, that's kind of the overview of, of what Jira is. Um, it's extremely powerful. Uh, like Drupal, which is one reason it's kind of appealing to me, is that it is uh, modular and extendable. So you can update your personal or company's system to adapt to how you need it to be, meaning custom fields, uh, the way the workflows are. Uh, do you need one workflow for UX and design versus back-end development? Um, all of that can be done pretty easily in Jira. And I'm happy to talk ad nauseum about Jira after this session. If you have any questions or want to see demos or anything like that, please uh, hunt me down and ask me questions. So, uh, I'm going to start somewhere. Don't trust anybody who tells you anything online. That's not true. That's all. I just want to need a, somewhere to, to, uh, to start from. Uh, let me give you a quick introduction about myself. My name is Chris Urban. Um, I was a manager of professional services at Acquia for, uh, for a while. I've been using Drupal for a long time. Um, I'm both um, project management side, so I'm a scrum master, scrum professional, blah, blah, blah. But I'm also a Drupal uh, site builder and developer. So I kind of saddle both worlds, uh, like the aha video slamming between walls. That's kind of how my day is. Um, the job I'm trying to convey here for today is to give you a little bit of a crash course about Agile and give you a little bit about Jira so that if you are interested, give you at least some starting points or some pointers what to do or what not to do. Now, most importantly, just to get, a, again, a sense, um, how many of you are using Jira like on your day-to-day -day projects right now? Okay, so about half the room. 
Um, so hopefully some of the stuff that I'll tell you, you're either doing already, um, and I'm going to give you about a dozen or so little bits of goodness. Um, if you're not, I would recommend trying it or finding a way to try it, and I think it will make your, make your lives a little bit easier. Um, so first thing let's talk about is um, Agile development. Um, for those that do not know that, um, the idea is that you do not want to build your application, your software, your website. You don't want to do it like this. You want to do it like this. You want to get the minimum viable thing done first, and then add and add and add until you get to the final product. This is what Jira really can help you and your team uh, organize and maintain um, in terms of prioritizing a backlog, understanding what the features that your customer or your project requires, um, using the backlog within Jira to um, organize those into either a Kanban or a Scrum-based board. Um, now, the most important thing here uh, that I'll be referencing, in terms of development, in terms of Agile software development, there's essentially two different styles that can be done, and you can actually do them both at the same time. One is Kanban, which is a Japanese approach, what, uh, what is limited basically by capacity. If you have one developer, they should work on one thing at a time. So as soon as one thing is done, they can take the next thing from the pile and work on it. If you have a team, it's capacity based on that team. And the Kanban board is basically what I have to do, what I can do or I'm doing right now, and what is done. So a Kanban board is essentially that. If you have five people on your team, there shouldn't be more than five things in, in progress. That's the, that's the premise. A scrum board is now you, you modify that a little bit and you compartmentalize it into a unit of time. Typically two weeks, it could be one week, it could be four weeks, but now you have a backlog of items that you want to get done in that work unit, in that time period, and everyone on the team is working together to get that unit of work done, not the entire backlog for the entire project, it's the building the first sprint, the second sprint, the third sprint, and so on. And this is your typical, at least in my view, typical um, process for building a Drupal application or a Drupal site is something that you're doing over the course of several sprints. You want to get the basic core up and running, probably add some basic content types taxonomy, now you're getting into theming and views, et cetera, et cetera, and refining until you get to that final project, final product that your customer wants. So all of the things that we're going to be talking about today are really organized or oriented more towards this style, this Scrum-based style of development. So now that I've given you that quick background, does anybody have any questions on this? Has anything I've said sounded completely foreign? No, but um, so can you repeat the Kanban board? Are, is the work for the Kanban time box? No. Or are you just plucking from the top of your Correct. backlog? Correct. Yep. So that's, one, that's a good question. There's essentially two different backlogs. There is a product backlog, which is the entire project backlog. When you get to Scrum, now you have a sprint backlog, which is a subset of that product backlog. The Scrum is time boxing it to say, I just want to get this set of items done first, and then my next set, then my next set. And typically, you actually don't even know what is in, let's say, sprint N plus 5, because your priorities may change, and that's the whole benefit of working in Agile. The customer says, oh, we don't need this, we could do this instead. Or it's more likely, we don't want just this, we want this also, and now you have to adjust your priorities. Kanban is where there is no time limit, and it's basically whatever is on the top of the pile is the next thing that the next developer is going to take. But is it really the most important thing to be doing right now? That's the balancing act. It becomes a little bit more difficult. Kanban is really, in my view, better suited for ongoing development, let's say maintenance after you've launched. Now we're working towards the next release. That's when you shift into Kanban. But if you're, you've got a time deadline, you've got to get a site launched, you want to do sprint style or scrum style, and now you can prioritize and say, okay, what are we going to get done right now? We've got to get the site up and running, a core, add to it, add to it, add to it, and now you have uh, an, a minimum viable product or a, the basics. That's what you want to get to for your you know, sprint five, let's say. So, okay. All right, so now, the this is all great, fine and dandy, 
but we know how it is to really do work, right? And the problems there are all the things that you run into with, um, I don't say you're a problematic customer, but you're a typical customer, right? You're going to have the unrefined request halfway through the project. Oh, we need a blah, 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 because the CEO decided he wants it, right? Or something like that. Um, or you have multiple product owners. You have the person from the marketing side and then the person from the IT side or from the person from the content editing side. They're all having their requests, but their number one request is not the same as this other person's number one request. So now you have three number one requests. Which one really do you work on? Um, and they're not really sure what they're working towards. Like they want to get a slate up. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? Do you need this feature? Do I need that feature? It's not completely clear. If you don't ever have any of these types of problems, and if you had, then that means, yeah, you really have been working in Drupal for a while. Um, the problem is, how do you work around this? That is really the goal of today's session, is to give you all the options or the things to enter your toolkit or your tool bed belt to be able to answer all of these questions and answer these requests that you run into. So, okay, now that we've talked about that, how can we do this and how are we going to do this with Jira? So, um, what we should be talking about, what we really want to be focusing on is not um, uh, uh, how, how you should do it, meaning don't Use what I'm going to give you next as your guidance and adapt it. Don't do it explicitly the same. The, tr the trick is to give you an idea of what you can do. Um, but what, I, what, I sh what I'll show you or I'll give you is not necessarily the best way, uh, which is, again, one of the reasons why I love Jira, because it's the same as Drupal. There's eight different ways to do the same thing. Which one is the right way? And it's up to you and your team to figure that out. All I can do is show you one possible solution, right? All right, so now we're going to have some fun. I broke this out into a couple different sections, and I'm going to show you a picture, and you're going to have to tell me what the topic is. And the first one is really hard, so don't feel bad that you're not going to get it. I was trying to make a, I was, I was feeling very snarky when I updated my deck. So. <laughs> So, <laughs> my first question is, uh, has anyone um, feel like they're an advanced Jira user? And if you, uh, I'll, if, do you, have you ever used JQL? Have you ever used Jira query language? Mm -hmm. The one tomato throwing guy. Okay, so, <laughs> so you know who this woman is and what she does for a living. She... <laughs> See? She answers queries. <laughs> right, okay, so now you're getting the idea. This is the idea between these pictures. So, queries are the way you get the information out of Jira after you've had your team put in all their tickets. Your customer has given them, given you all the requests that you want your site to have. You've turned those into developable. Uh, work units or tickets that a developer can take and use, right? So the trick is to figure out, okay, I've got all this information in Jira, I've got 500 tickets for this project, how do I know what to work on next? How do I organize those? How can I present that back to the customer in a way that I can, that they won't, their heads won't explode? Queries or JQL is, is the answer, and this is probably the most important thing that you want to play with, because when you learn this, then you really understand the power of using um, of using Jira. So JQL is Jira query language, like SQL is structured query language. Um, it's very powerful, it helps you find exactly what you want, and the more you know about it, the more you can find exactly what it is that you're looking for. So you are talking to a customer and they're saying, oh, how much work is related to blankety blank, or how much work is remaining, or how do I know how much is done and how much is remaining, or how much has been done, or what was something that broke? All of those questions can be answered with a query. Um, and if you learn this, this to me is like the, the most foundational, most important thing to do. And there is fortunately a way to play around with it that's not destructive. And if you find something that you do like and find useful, you can save it. And that's what we're going to go through first. So how do you do this? If you are in a project, and so all this is going to be screenshots from a dummy project, so nothing, um, your mileage may vary, 
right? That's, that's the example I'm showing. But in your typical instance, when you're looking in your project and you click on the little um, search icon, you'll get a menu on the left-hand side. And one of them is all issues. And we'll start with that. If you open this and you see this project has only one lonesome orphan ticket. My god, that's so beautiful. Um, if you go all the way over to the right, you'll see a button that says advanced search. And you'll want to bookmark that. When you click on that, you will typically get something that looks like this, which is show me the projects, show me the types of tickets, what their status is, who they're assigned to, and then you can pick uh, any number of other uh, parameters or filters that you want to add to it by clicking on that more. If you click on advanced, you will get this as a GQL entry. And that is what you want to be using. Don't waste your time with this crap up here. Just <laughs> type, in the, type it in what you want. So in this case, show me everything that's been updated in the last year. Not that you would ever do that, but this is to give you an idea and an order by what I looked at last. So you can sort tickets and filter tickets based on any tons of possible parameters. But to give you uh, some basics so that your head doesn't explode, <coughs> the simplest is what project you're in, right? So my project that I'm using as my example here is just work, right? Everything has a short um, three or four letter acronym, you know, ABC-1, ABC-2 are your tickets. The simplest is just show me all the tickets that are in my current project. Maybe you have multiple projects. Show me all the tickets that are in my project but are only stories and bugs, right? Not epics. Everybody knows the difference between an epic and a story or a feature, right? Or a subtask. We'll get to those later. Just give me stories or bugs. Or show me everything in my project that doesn't have, that has an attachment. Somebody uploaded a screenshot and it's been updated in the last week, right? So somebody has some something they filed a bug maybe, but maybe they didn't make it a bug, but they put a screenshot in, you can find them all. Or, this is where your head really starts to explode, <laughs> show me all the tickets in my current project in a sprint that's currently open, because I'm using Agile, so I'm in sprint two of five, so only the tickets that are in sprint two. And it went, is in progress, but it's not because it was reopened because of the way my workflow was, right? And I'll get to that in a minute. So I can find out all the tickets that are in current sprints that are basically in the first pass of development because it hasn't gone through QA and got rejected or it hasn't gone to UAT by the customer and got rejected. Somebody just picked up the ticket, basically. Or show me all the tickets that were in a specific sprint and they were reopened from QA specifically. So I can say, okay, I have 50 tickets in Sprint 999. Of those, 100 of them were reopened. Of those, 50 of those were reopened at QA. Now I can get into much more granular reporting that you do not get out of JIRA out of the box, but you'd have to tally this manually. So that's where I get into the advanced part later. We'll talk about how you can put this all into a Google Sheet, and as you get through your sprints, especially as you have a long-term project, Sprint one, our reopen rate was 80 per sprint, 80 percent. Sprint two, our reopen rate was 60 percent. Sprint three, our reopen rate was 20 percent. So you can show progress to your customer to say, hey, this is what we expect from a project. The first sprint, everybody gets their sea legs, right? By sprint three, they should have a really low reopen rate. Um, you want to be able to demonstrate that. Now you have queries that you can do that with. So a lot of this, this is all. This is nothing new. This is all documented on the Atlassian site. They have excellent documentation about uh, JQL. I, I, I encourage you to spend the time to explore and go through it. Like I said, this is the foundation for a lot of the other things I'm going to go through next. It's basically taking this and now applying it. Once you figure out what it is that you're looking for or what, you're, what the data is that you're wanting to get out of your project, now you can start taking this and using it. And that's where really the magic starts to happen. All right, so any questions so far? I'll post a copy of this deck on the site, and uh, so don't worry about writing all this down real quick. All right, we'll start all over again. What is this? A filter. So, filters are your other best friend in JIRA. Once you have one of those queries saved, for example, show me all the tickets in this project, in the current sprint, or in all open sprints, 
that haven't been reopened. You can save it and share it with everybody on your project. So you're not sending people JQL strings in Slack. You just point them to my site slash filter equals one, two, three. Because you've saved it, you've named it, it generates a link and ID, and you can always go back and update it. But this is the key for getting your rest of your team on board transparency as to how everybody's performing. Once you have that filter set up, save it and share it. Can you also uh, break it down by releases? Well. Yeah, fixed versions, releases, however you're organizing it, it'll be just another parameter in that query string. Okay. Yep, absolutely. And we'll, and we'll, we'll get to those later too. Okay. Um, but now here's the thing that everybody always forgets, most important, once you save a filter, always go and update the shares. It always is not shared by default. It's always your filter. It doesn't ever share it publicly. You have to tell it to share it, add it and then save. This is the one thing about the UI I can't stand, but once you know to look for this, you'll figure that out. This will please save one of you some time. Why isn't everybody seeing my filter? Because you didn't share it. And you can say, um, you don't have to do a project. I typically do it this way. Um, but it could be just by you know instance, um, specific user. Um, again, something you want to play with. Now, a good reason for doing this Maybe you want a quick way of saying, okay, show me all the tickets that were in Sprint 2. When you open a Sprint, create a Sprint filter, you know, show me all tickets in Project Work, and Sprint equals Sprint 2. Save that as a filter. Once you have that saved, everybody can go back and always have the same list that everybody else has. Well, that ticket came out of the Sprint. Well, guess what? The filter updates right away if the ticket comes out or if a ticket comes in. It's always the current list. Don't have to keep sending a Excel spreadsheet back and forth. Don't don't do that. You make sure to do all the work, right? That's like the most. This is ninety percent of the use case right here. The first one. All these other things. These are just on top of it, like cream on the icing in the cake. Um, you want to prevent confusion. Other rule of thumb is: do not call your Sprint One Sprint One, <laughs> please, because if you do and you have other projects, you're going to have all the other Sprint 1s show up when you want to go back and find it. Give it a project name like Work Sprint 1 or Customer Sprint 1. I know this sounds, goes without saying, but Jira defaults to just using Sprint 1, which is really annoying. Um, namespace. Yeah, namespace, right. Um, I am a nerd, so I usually put in the ID. When it matches, so you'll see like 126 or 163 is the Sprint ID. Um, or because you have multiple projects in your cloud account, that's another typical scenario, put the work tag up front. So you know, work sprint one, so that everybody can find your, your sprints quicker. Okay, next. Um, once you have those, another thing that you can do this, uh, do this is helpful for are either the dashboards in Jira, some people like to use them, some people don't, but then you can generate reports off of those saved filters Show me all the tickets that are planned, all the tickets that have been done, or the tickets that are open currently. And if you really start thinking about it, you actually don't have to say this is a filter. Just use them as they are. When you're building your uh, scrum board, you can have swim lanes, right? And people sometimes put in by epic. That's, uh, okay, I can see why, but to me that's dumb. No offense. Um, do you want to, if you want to get a snapshot view of everything going on in your project, you build a Kanban board and you use this as your swim lanes and now you essentially have scrum boards within the Kanban board. So you see what I'm saying? So you have everything that's in the, in the entire project, but now it's swim lane by what is actually everybody working on right now, what was everybody working on before, and what is on deck, and then is there anything else? And now you have everything segmented in one master board, grooming, development, UAT, and production deployment in one place. Right? And that's when the customer says, well, what do we have left to do? Let's go to the board and see. We have a lot to do. We need more budget. Let's see where this is going. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm being... Labels. labels, thanks, okay. <laughs> so, labels, this is one of those things that I see either never being used or it needs to be done more. Um, and I try to toe the line here, I try to use it um, sparingly, 
One of the use cases, I can go on for hours, but I picked one specific one. At the end of a sprint, if you're doing Agile, if you're doing scrums, you should do a demo. It doesn't have to be all the tickets in the sprint, but it should be a good you know, representative selection. How do you figure out which tickets are they? Use a demo label. And if you have a demo label, that means you can create a filter to say, show me all the tickets in my project that are in the current open sprint and they're marked for demo. And guess what? When I get to sprint three, I don't have to do anything to the filter. When I get to sprint four, I don't have to do anything to the filter. Because I already closed the sprint, we did it, I'm on the next sprint. I don't have to ever change this filter. So you can give everybody, the customer, everybody in your team, the same filter link. Don't have to go back and update it. Do it once and you're done. Easy. Pain in the ass, right? Because everybody's like, well, which one do we want to do next? Okay. If you Once you have this thing set up, you can then organize on the on the priority board the order of appearance for the demo, or if you want to be really tricky, use like another like obscure field that nobody uses, like points. No, I'm just kidding. Um, some other maybe extra field and use that for a marker to sort the order of appearance if you have a really, really large project. In most cases, just having the list of tickets is like half the battle. The sellies will be keeping everybody on the same page. Okay, next. My car! No, get it. I try to actually do drive a little time, but not at all. Components! I know this is hard. <laughs> it's okay. So, components is the, to labels, like labels on crack to me. I prefer components, and I do this more for consistency among projects. But the idea here is that you have your epics, right? Um, let's say um, the feature is to give users the ability to see the latest news from the company. So that means you've got what a view block on the home page with the last five news releases. There's a view all press releases page, right, a landing page, and then there's maybe some other blocks on other pages or some connectivity with taxonomy among those press releases, whatever. You get the idea, right? Every project has that. So you have a news releases epic, and that probably includes front end and back end work, or the theming is done as a separate epic. However you have your tickets organized, the components allow you to organize them in another dimension, or another level, and I would say to take the tact from looking at it from a debugging perspective. So if you have an issue on your home page that's related to um, those news releases, you should go back and look at all tickets that were tagged with a component content home page or content news article. So it's by content type or area of the site, like global navigation. So now you can organize all your tickets in another fashion uh, above and beyond what the name of the ticket is and what the original epic was. Meaning, you may have front end and back end in separate epics. This way you can keep them organized together for the purposes of finding what was done recently. So everything that was affecting the global menu, it could be front end, it could be back end, you'd be able to find those tickets faster. So how do you do that consistently? The first thing, and we'll get to that in a second, is to start with the same list on all projects that everybody gets used to. You will always have the custom content type per Drupal project, but even if you, like say, distill it down to the rudimentary ones, like I was mentioning a news release, right, or a calendar of events, every project like seems to have one or the other. Um, start with those, and as the, as the projects progress, you can add components as you go along, but start with some basic ones that always, you're always gonna have analytics or advertising or metadata. There's always gonna be a footer, there's always gonna be a menu, there's always gonna be a home page. You're always gonna do image editing, you're always gonna do content editing, and you will always have some kind of article. Just that alone, you can organize all the tickets that way. So then when you have a bug that pops up, you can go back and say, okay, show me all the tickets in the last three sprints that were tagged as content article. Now you have a short list of tickets to go back and look for um, uh, why that thing doesn't work. Now, I'm making all of this case, think of this, um, we're pretending that there's no QA going on, we're pretending there's no automated testing going on, or pretending that you're not using like some continuous integration tool that's doing a build and test before it pushes the code out. I'm assuming this is the worst, that you're doing development on production, right? Just imagine. How would you find a bug fast? 
um, you have to go back to what was released. So if you organize it this way, now you have a worst case scenario of trying to figure out what work was done recently. So I like to start with a short list. <laughs> um, and I have, this is going to be all posted on one of the two repos. You know, take it, use it, see so you know, whatever you want. It's just a CSV list. But 90% of the time, all these will be on your project at some, at some extent. If you have that organized, when you go in to create tickets, when you're grooming, tag it with the component, and, and you're done. Then you can go back and say, oh, show me everything that affected the home page. Right? What will that affect? Now you have a way of doing it. All right. Let's keep going. A lot, a lot to cover here. Science. I know, it's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you came to this session. <laughs> now, um, I like to uh, strongly recommend if you have multiple teams, like a, let's say you have an offshore team in India, you have another team in EMEA, you have a team in the US, or an East Coast team and a West Coast team, add that as a field. Maybe you want to see how they're performing, or you want to make sure that the teams are working on all the different things. You know you have an assignee and you have a reporter, but that doesn't tell me who worked on the ticket when it comes to QA and to the end of the life cycle. Make sure to add a developer field. So as the developer submits their ticket for review, right, it has to go to somebody to do code review or an architect to review the code and gets merged in, right? Everybody's doing that? So how do you know who the developer was? You're going back into the JIRA tickets and scrolling through all the comments to say, oh yeah, I posted this PR. Just make that another field, right? So now you have it at the same place with the assignee and the original reporter, which also means that the customer can say, oh, Chris, you were the one who developed work one, two, three. I got a question, you know, what, is this supposed to happen? You can make that process a little bit more transparent. If you have multiple teams, you can also assign, you know, team A, team B, US, and MIA, um, so that you can see how teams are performing. Uh, you know, most, most importantly, it's just to know who did the work on the ticket when you want to go back. Now, I'm not trying to say this snarkily, but you know that when you have a development team, there's always the one person who is the rock star, and then there's the one person who's, you know, maybe you need to replace them with somebody else. If you need the ammunition to say, to make that case, because you have, you know, you're getting paid, the customer's expecting top quality. If you need to be able to make a case, how are you going to be able to go back to your resourcing person, or if you're using a partner of that agency, and say, hey, listen, um, I'm sorry, Chris is not working out for us. Oh, oh, yeah? Well, why not? Well, because this query that shows the number of reopens from QA, 80% of the tickets are Chris's. So, you know, WTF, let's get another person in for Chris. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, if I don't, you know, you have to look at it that way. I, I mean, this is a harsh truth, but. If you need that ammunition, that's the only way you're going to be able to do that is by tracking that. Yes? So why would you want to, I guess, what would be different from that and like an assign to, because then you're seeing who's working on. So the assignee only should be during in progress is the developer. If that goes now to code review, it should be assigned to the lead or senior or technical architect. Once it goes to QA, it should be assigned to who's doing it in QA, and then when it gets to UAT, it should be assigned to the customer, right? So they're, they're not the, that, it keeps changing based on state. Or unless you use subtests. Right, don't even do, just make it a separate field, that's my point. Now you're creating tickets for the, for the sake of doing it, just make another field. It's easy enough. And just put it in, you know, put it right in below uh, assignee and reporter, so it always shows up on the ticket. The other thing is that it's also a point of, I mean, I'm looking at it as a negative. Look at it as a point of pride. When you get to the demo, do you want all the demos from the same developer? You want everybody to do a turn, so now you have a way of saying, okay, Chris, what ticket do you want to show from the last sprint? Um, Adam, what ticket do you want to show from the last sprint? Now you have another mechanism of keeping track of that stuff, because with 50 tickets in a sprint, do you really remember who was working on which? I can't. Yeah, and that's the point I was going to say. I mean, I see so much value in that because if you're 10 sprints down the road, you're trying to recall, oh, who worked on this piece back in sprint two? The tracer bullet back in two, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's like almost a subject matter expert, right? Because like you might have 20 or 30 different people touching the system, 
And so going back and having that kind of uh, metadata to me is incredibly valuable. Yes. Um, will you show how to add custom fields to the default ticket or issue? Yeah, I can. I don't have it in the deck, but I, I can. I can show you afterwards. It's pretty. It's, you have to have administrative permissions in your Jira, but um, it's it's pretty easy to do. Now, I caution. Now, I'm not, this is really. <laughs> it's a can of worms. Jira, because it's modular. Imagine um, you are the customer in your Drupal site, and you say, "Oh, I just want to add a field to my." Article, okay, do you do that in production in config or do you go back and add it in code? It's kind of like that in Jira. You should do it. You should add it to your schema for that type of issue, for that type of project, for that type of workflow. There's a lot of things that it impacts. Um, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't undertake it and you shouldn't do it, but have a well-organized plan. And it does mean going through all the screens in Jira, all the places that it appears, I can give you like the laundry list of the top five things to look for, but something like this is a pretty straightforward change, but it does have it does have impacts. You do have to go back, you know, when you go to the detail page, it should show up there. You have to go in and say, yeah, I do want it there. That's the pain in the ass factor. Okay, let's keep going. Because how much time do I have left? Five, five, ten minutes? I'm blowing through. Am I until a quarter after? Twenty after? Until thirty-five after. Good. Oh, plenty of time. Okay, no tables. Tables, easy, right? Okay. Chairs. My chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. A table. table. Yeah. Okay. All right, all right. I'll make a note of that for next time. <laughs> so, um, this is actually a, this is a quick one. Um, is anyone using Confluence along with Jira, especially if you have a cloud-based uh, one? Okay. So we could probably oh, if for for the handful of you that do. The, the assumption is that you're using more than one product because you're using them, they're both Atlassian, they can be connected. And Confluence is just a wiki, I mean, plain and simple. But because it's connected to Jira, all those filters, all those queries, you can embed in your pages. So if you're writing a report about Sprint 2, right, when you get to the end of Sprint 2, you have to send out a report because you're fixed capacity or you want to show the customer what was done, make Jira and Confluence do the work for you. Use the same query for every sprint to build out the table of work that was done in that sprint. And now you have a page the customer can go to. Maybe they don't have access to Jira, but they do have access to the wiki. They can see what's going on. And you can add all kinds of, I um, can't really see in this slide, but you can adjust what's being shown, but just at, a little, at the simplest, the ticket, the summary, the epic that it was associated to, and maybe, I don't know, you know, its status. And now you have a working table that says, hey, here are all the tickets that are still in progress, here's all the tickets that are in QA, here are the tickets that are done. And they can see right away they don't have to go to Jira. So quick question, so in regards to once a guild hits UAT, and say for instance you have an agency that's doing UAT for the site, mm -hmm. and there's back and forth for tickets open and closed, that's sent back up to your own, can you run a report to kind of compare and contrast like how many times the ticket is open, closed, it wasn't even an issue, or things like yes. that? Yes. Like, no yes yeah. and no. So there, there, is a, there is a catch. You can track with the query that it was reopened from a specific state. So not you can run that it was reopened, you can run that it was reopened from a specific state, but native Jira will not yeah. count the cycles. So if, if your workflow is, let's say, um, ready, in progress, okay. QA, UAT, done. Let's say that's the, the probably the strip, most stripped down I can think of. If it got to QA and the person doing QA said, nope, failed, or, you have to have a reopened state, you don't send it back to in progress because that means somebody's working on it right away. No, you have to have a, another queue to hold it, right? Not ready, but a reopened state. If you have your workflow set up that way, you can track then that specific path as opposed to rejected by the customer in UAT to reopen. Um, and that also opens a whole other can of worms of, okay, it's day eight of my two week sprint and a customer reopens a ticket in UAT. Do we do it now or does it go into the next sprint or does it go into the backlog? Yeah. Right? That's another, um, you, your, again, your mileage may vary. As long as you have the states tracked, you can count the t 
tickets that make it through that path, but you cannot iterate, you cannot count the number of iterations. So if a ticket went through that cycle five times, uh, Jira will not track that. You do need a. So you uh, have to kind of customize it and put that iteration in there and saying this is UAT1, UAT2, UAT3. Mm, no, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't, I would, I would, there are plugins you can get that will add that counting to it, but my argument is, I, what will that, what's the benefit of that? What, what, what's the difference between it being reopened once as opposed to five times? You can track it. You may want to just add a comment in the ticket and use that. Right, because if, if that's what's happening, then there's a bigger problem going on. So what? There's a problem here. Right, that's, uh, okay, we need to pause, customer, and let's lay down some rules and say, okay, this is the way it's supposed to work. You're kind of fucking it up. Right? Um, anyway, so that's, this is about Confluence specifically, but you could, and this is where the, le the later part of this presentation will go, what if you don't have Confluence? You can use a Google Sheet and do the same kind of thing. That's what the point was to this. If you do have Confluence, I, I suggest adding, it's called the insert Jira issues or filter. Remember we were talking about that earlier? You create a filter, you save it. Now you can insert it as a table in your page, which means you have a ready set list of tickets or a report you can put in anywhere in your, um, in your wiki. Okay, next one. I'm from Philly, by the way, sorry. You mentioned this. <laughs> Not a task, but a subtask. Ah, 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 sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> subtasks, this is one of those things. This is one of those things. Um, it really depends on the project. Um, I, my pendulum swing is now I try to avoid subtasks. But there are distinctly specific cases where you would want to have them. The easiest ones are whenever there is some other review that has to happen. Because let's say the product owner, the customer that's working with you for reviewing the tickets, 90% of the stuff they can handle, but maybe there's a design team. And you know, they want everything to be perfect, so there has to be somebody from the design team to review and okay that ticket, create a subtask for them. Because then you can point fingers and say, hey, design team, this is supposed to be reviewed on day five, and where are you? You're holding everything up, you're a blocker, you're gonna run our budget over, you see where I'm going with this. You wanna be able to trace where the, or where the assignments are going or what the dependencies are outside of the system. If you use subtasks for this, it makes it extremely clear and explicit without, how do I say this, without impacting the sanctity of the original ticket. What I mean is, you can add comments that, hey, design team is out on vacation or they're doing their retreat in Hawaii, and nobody really cares about that because this ticket is talking about the actual design work. Like, oh, we need to do a, you know, an entity reference, not a view. That's what's happening in here. This is that other team problem, right? That's, the, that's like the most exp explicit case I can, th I can think of. The other thing is that, if you're not doing uh, bad testing or test writing automatically, this is a way to kind of ease into it. You create a subtask for each ticket to say, write a subtask, uh, write a test for this ticket. Because they may not get that done at the same time as the actual work, but you want it to be associated with the ticket and not lose that connection. This is another way of doing it. So I think this gets back to Jira being able to be set up different ways. Mm -hmm. This is one point where I was on a team at Aqua where we used only subtasks, and basically each ticket was essentially a swim lane. So yeah, that's crazy. That's, mm -hmm. that's it works really well. I, <laughs> <laughs> but how many tickets are in a sprint? I guess that's a bit. So there really, were not a lot, like maybe five. Right, but so from my perspective, that's really, it should have been epics and stories, or the epic is the feature, that was the original ticket. So. But it, then there were epics that had dozens of those in them. Right. So yeah. this is the, this is where I yes I would argue you, you're right. But I'm also I'm looking at it from the web site development perspective, and you're looking at it from pure software development, mm -hmm. and you really are rolling out features with um, epics and stories in them, as opposed to I'm just building a site, and this is a I'm I'm going to say a short-term project, probably not more than six months. Yours is more, you do need to keep things organized and you have a longer, uh, broader depth to, to cover. Mm. Um, from a Drupal perspective, I'd argue you should be used sparsely. Mm. So. Um, can I give you an example of a subtask that I've 
example of where we're using subtasks is we're using them, so we have an epic called bio for the bio content type, and then if a task or a story was being the bio content type that's linked to the epic, yep. but if that were just, if all the work were done on that one ticket, the PR was too big, so then we're using subtasks to do like do the basic content type pages, a separate subtask for being the entity reference to like their event, and so now I just started introducing subtasks in that way, but now I'm worried. I would I would take subtasks entirely out of it. Meaning, if okay. there's code being committed, I, I'll turn that around. I almost look at this as a post-it note and more of a non-deployable work associated with it. Mm -hmm. If there's any work that's associated with it, it should be the, its own ticket. And connected tickets is related to or blocked by that way. They're still going to be rolling up to the same epic uh, content type, whatchamacallit. Um, but then you have a back-end ticket, a theming ticket, oh, I forgot we need to do one more ticket for blankety blank and um, update the display mode for views. All four tickets will still roll up to the same epic and all four tickets can be related to each other. Um, but if they're, if they're already connected by epic, then I don't, I don't, I'd argue that I don't know what the value of breaking it into one more level of a subtask is. To keep it, if it's, if it's to keep it associated to one ticket, then just make it associated to that ticket. Do it as it relates to. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're in the ticket, you can see, hey, ticket one, two, three is related to theming one, two, four, and update display mode one, two, five. Just do it that one. I guess so I was using the main story ticket to say, okay, once all of these are done, then look at all of them holistically and close it. So then that's another question. Right. So this does get into the question of where the release or the version that's being deployed, what's the, where is the deployment starting and stopping? Can you release back-end work only without theming? I would say, why not? I mean, you could. If, as long as the customer understands that you're doing things incrementally, you could have a back-end ticket in one sprint and a front-end in another. Why not? What, what, why do they have to be kept together? Is it, if you're QAing functionality from an editing point of view, the front end is irrelevant. If you're looking at how the thing looks, it really doesn't matter how you put it in, as long as the content is showing the way it should. I, I'd completely decouple it. Mm -hmm. But that's me, so I'm a little crazy. Well, and that's for a project that, like you said, like this is for like a site. Um, we uh, are maintaining a platform, so a lot of times you can't release the back end without the front end right customers are already using it well well then you get into like feature branching you could do it that way because it's probably more likely that you have a lot of associated tickets together and you can only release them all together at once you're going to do a feature branch release and you just have to maintain two or more tracks at the same time but then again that's getting again to the swim lanes and the query construction the need for teams and labels and custom fields because now you're using a fixed version right yeah yeah, fun stuff. That's what I love talking about. Um, all right, let's keep moving. Uh, but now I am running out of time, right? There's something yeah, left. Ten minutes. All right, let's go through this really quick. Guard. Yeah. So we talked about this before. Just to reiterate, um, you do want to be doing, you know, your demo and retro at the end of your sprint. You should do sprint planning if you're not already. Um, this is just a, an aside. This is my me being altruistic. You should have an agreed upon plan with your customer to say, I'm in sprint five and the top three things we're going to get done in sprint five are this thing, this thing, and this thing. And it's this order of importance. And if they agree to it at the beginning of the sprint, when something shows up on day nine, you can point them back and say, I remember you said this was one, two, and three. Well, what's this thing? It's not one, two, or three. That's it. Right? The other reason I say this is that if you were using that developer field, if you have work that's part of a longer string of things, use that person that was associated with the original work, as Adam was saying, the subject matter expert. You can use them to help guide that work. So you're not putting all the effort onto another developer that hasn't touched the work before but knows what the overall process is. You can now use that field to say, oh, so-and-so worked on this before. They should really be the one to do this extra 
this additional work now, this extra round or whatever the additional feature is. You do want to try to keep streamlined and optimize those workflows. That's that was the reason for adding all those fields earlier. So, okay, next. Pruning? Yes, pruning. <laughs> So if you have a project that is going on and on and on and on, and you have you know, tickets that are 400 days old, it's time to prune. Um, I was just talking about this with Amy June about the DO issue queue, which you can imagine is like 10 times this. Um, but the idea is, if you do have a long-term project, especially if you're doing like more maintenance development, ongoing work, it's been a year since the release and you're on version you know, 1.5 now, and you're doing new features and stuff, but there's still things that are in the backlog that are staler than I don't know what. Make a query, you know, show me everything that is not closed, that was never in a sprint. It's a story, and it hasn't been touched in 14 weeks, in a quarter. If it hasn't been touched in 14 weeks, it's not important. Close it. If it is important, they'll reopen it. <laughs> right? It's a ticket. You have no idea how cathartic this is to do on a Friday afternoon with a couple of uh, people, uh, product owners and some beers. <laughs> Go around and look at this list and they're like, yeah, close it. Just close it. <laughs> Anybody, come on. Blame. No. <laughs> Literally. Pointing. Pointing. Okay. So how does everybody size uh, development tickets? Uh, who here is using ours? Who here is using t-shirt sizes? Small, medium, large, extra large. Who here is using Fibonacci story points? How are you sizing tickets? Fibonacci hours. Fibonacci hours. <laughs> <laughs> Who has time to size? Well, then how are you planning what's going in your sprints to know what you can fit? So you do need to do planning. You should do grooming before you do planning. So you have to write the ticket. Make sure that you have all the information that is needed. The developer can take the ticket and go with it. They, they don't have to ask anybody any questions. They can just take it and go, right? That's the idea. Ticket has to be ready to go. The most important thing you need to know is, well, is it something easy? Is it I'm fixing a typo? It's a one point. Or is it that I'm building out a whole new content type and three views and some weird, uh, you know, permissions roll, what I see is what displays differently kind of thing. That's maybe five or eight points, right? Something that'll take the full sprint for me to build. You have to have some idea so that you know how much work you, what your capacity for work is in the next sprint. You should be doing pointing uh, or sizing, right? And that should be done probably with grooming if you can. I highly recommend using something like pointing poker. Um, and what you do is you can basically set up a shot clock and say, okay, we've got five minutes, I'm gonna to talk to you about this ticket, and everybody on the call <laughs> logs in, and everybody votes, and you don't see what everybody votes until everybody has voted. And so you can either use this to get consensus, to say, yep, okay, I see why you think it's a 13, I think it's an eight, and then you have consensus, or everybody votes eight, and one person votes at two, you see that somebody's either not understanding the ticket, or everybody who voted eight is thinking of something completely differently, you make sure that everybody understands what's in the ticket. That's what the goal is. It's not to get to the magic consensus number. It's to find out who's interpreting the ticket differently and what is not being communicated clearly. Because again, the goal is to get a ticket that the developer can take and go build it and build what you or the product owner had in their head without asking questions. Right? That's the name of the game. If that works, everybody's happy. Question here, how do you capture the discussion that happens during this process? Uh, so it's probably a matter of, uh, you, you hopefully have the product owner on the call and someone, either the scrum master or uh, project manager, is either updating the ticket in real time. You already have a user story and acceptance criteria and maybe some implementation details and maybe an attachment or two and some descriptions, depending on what the ticket is. Not install Drupal, but you know, build a news release content type, right? So you've got your list of fields, what you're being used, what the thing looks like on the front end. You've got all the pieces in place. If that's not clear, or if maybe there's some weird entity reference that somebody's not getting, you would be able to figure that out immediately because they're sizing it differently. If everybody understands it the same way, they should all size it the same way, right? In theory. 
So this is a, basically using the knowledge or the wisdom of the crowd most efficiently. And if you can do it time box, you know, you groom a ticket in two to three minutes, it really shouldn't take more than that. Um, you can blow through, you know, 30 tickets in an hour, which is, that's a lot, which means you only need to do this twice a week and you have your next sprint pretty much ready to go. That's what you should be doing. Yes? So if you're like in a maintenance mode and say we're using the Kanban like we did in the past and you're just plucking the tickets from the top, is pointing necessary? That's a great question. So I would argue, yes, you should probably still do it because number one, it validates that the info in the ticket is correct and by proof of sizing this, you kind of validate that, like everybody votes that it's an eight. This is a big piece of work, and it's gonna take this person two weeks to get done. Um, again, because it still has to be measured against some kind of effort or some period of time to do this. This also gives the product owner um, understanding of what's next in the queue. If it's a lot of ones, that means there's a lot of things that can be done. But if something is really important and it's an eight, they have to be able to know to say, hey, this means all these other little things have to wait until this one's done because this is going to tie up my team um, or tie up this one person for a while. So I would argue that it's still worthwhile doing. So, all right. Um, we should stop. Right? So let me go through a couple of things really quickly. Let me jump to the end and give you like the, the most important thing I wanted to tell you. What I was telling you before about using the queries and you create a query to say, you know, show me all the tickets that are stories. Show me all the tickets that are stories in this sprint. Show me the tickets that are stories in this sprint and have been reopened. Show me all the tickets that are in this sprint that have been reopened from QA. Once you have that kind of mindset, you can throw this into a Google Sheet and use a script in Google to authenticate to Jira, hit the endpoint and pull back the number of tickets and generate a report. So you can say, oh, my reopen rate is dropping over the course of time and the number of tickets in QA that were reopened, or the number of tickets that were reopened from UAT. You can actually start doing much more granular reporting that you cannot do in Jira natively. You can also, I'm doing this by sprint, but you could, instead of saying by ticket or bug, or specific type of bug, you can add it to a component to say, show me all the tickets around the home page. Remember I tagged them with component? Maybe the home page is a real pain in the butt. You have a way to document and show that is a pain in the butt. If you want to do it by team or by developer, you can do reporting this way. You can, you, can, you can go any number of ways with this thing, but the idea is to use JIRA to your advantage. You have to be diligent about cataloging and organizing all, the ticket, all those tickets up front, which is why you want the planning and the grooming, but adding those extra custom fields like developer or team or tagging them with components. Once you've done that, now you have a lot of data that you can now turn around and use. Yes, I argue for some projects, it's an in and out project, it's three months, I'm gonna be done with it before anybody asks for a report like this. This is really like thinking like a six, 12, 18 month project. You do wanna show progress. You wanna show that the team is improving. The QA is doing their job. The quality of work is not diminishing. Any of those, this is now giving you a, a vehicle for, for providing that information to the customer. So, how do you do all this? You just copy and paste this and throw that in there and you're done. Now, it's a little more than that, but I already did the work. It's already up on, um, in GitHub. If you go here, and there's one file, you basically want to take that and copy and paste it and put in, you have to base 64, I put all the instructions in there. Uh, base 64 and code your password to your Jira instance, but you should be able to essentially then um, make a simple formula or request like um, give me all the tickets in this sprint, um, just give me all the tickets in this sprint, give me the status of this particular ticket. So you can make queries around a sprint, right, a bucket of tickets, or around a specific ticket. So now you have a way to generate reports, let's say you have a shopping list of 50 tickets that have to get done for this project, you want one filter that shows the current status, but they don't have access to Jira. So how do you do that? You can build a Google Sheet, and every time you load it, it'll query Jira and get the latest status. So you're done. Because that is often the case, that so you have one or the other. All right.
I think that's it. I'll go through the rest of these things. If you have any questions, please come find me afterwards. I'm on Gmail or on Twitter or on Triple Auto Work. Hopefully this was some help. A lot of more technical detail than I, I we didn't get time to get to, but any quick any quick questions? Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thanks.